the most important aspects. Um, and so here are some of the learning objectives uh, which I've taken from your curriculum and I'm going to try and cover some cover some of the aspects of this and I'm going to be trying to use mainly a case-based approach um, just because I always found that was a better way to learn for myself. Uh, some of the cases will be challenging but hopefully you'll learn something from it anyway. Now pretty much like an ECG or a chest x-ray um, when you're looking through limb radiographs or pelvic radiographs you need to have a checklist or a systematic approach to go through uh, each one. Um, so there's no for any sort of trauma there's no um, sort of generic template that you can go through and check check off you need to know for a shoulder radiograph what what are your check areas for a knee radiograph what are your check areas and for the ones that we go through i'll definitely try and cover those um, if any of you are particularly interested um, this book is fantastic um, it's what we as registrars often uh, refer to our consultants tell us to refer to this um, the people who made this book uh, also run a course at Norfolk Park, which I'm sure there's an online iteration now. Um, so definitely recommend. I have no affiliation with them other than to say that it's a really good book. OK, so um, going to start off first case straight in. Um, if, so if we could get the poll function up as well. Um, so we've got a 40 year old man who's come in with shoulder pain following a fall. Um, he has this x-ray taken. What is the most likely diagnosis? So I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to answer that. 30 seconds starting now. So I believe that's around 30 seconds. We're just going to end the poll. Yep, let's see. OK, so great. 54% of you thought it was anterior glenic humeral dislocation, which is the correct answer. So well done to you guys. And we're going to go through that. So um, I think, first of all, just in terms of exam uh, technique or a few things that might make you think it's anterior as opposed to posterior um, without even looking at the radiograph is that uh, anterior is far, far more common than a posterior dislocation. And you only really see posterior dislocations in certain clinical scenarios, for example, in very high energy trauma uh, or patients presenting with seizures or if they've been electrocuted. Um, and yep, uh, looking at the radiograph, you can tell that this is dislocated as opposed to being subluxed because there's complete loss of apposition. But we're, we're going to go through all of that now. All right. So, how do we read a shoulder x ray? So, like I was saying, you need a checklist for each and every um, examination that you look at, and with each MSK radiograph, there's usually two views, and so you need to know how to look at each of the views individually. Um, so with a shoulder uh, x-ray, um, all radiology begins with anatomy, so we'll just briefly go through. Can you guys see my cursor, or do I need to bring up a... Uh, I see your cursor just pointed. fine, so the audience should be able to okay, as well. Great, fine. So, uh, yeah, th so this is the humerus, so we've got a, an AP view of the left uh, shoulder, so we've got this is the humerus and we've got the humeral head. We've got the greater tuberosity we're seeing here, the humeral neck and then the humeral shaft going down. Uh, we've got this bone coming along here, which is the clavicle. Uh, we've got this triangular shaped bone, which has got lots of different facets to it, which is the scapula. Um, and then different parts of it, if we have a look. So this bit is called the glenoid, which is what um, articulates with the humeral head. 
you've got this bit which articulates with the lateral end of the clavicle, which is the acromion. And then you've got this little bit of bone, which is, you can imagine it's pointing out towards you through the screen. It's called the coracoid, where uh, you have the um, insertion of muscles like coracobrachialis. And then of course, you've got lung and ribs, a bit of the mediastinum and a bit of the spine as well. Now, the first question that you need to ask yourself when looking at an AP view of a shoulder radiograph is, does the shape of the humeral heads look normal? And that's an easy question for someone who's looked at hundreds of shoulder x-rays, but if you haven't looked at many, it might be difficult. Um, so the way that I kind of um, pictured it and that some people advise that you should picture it is that it looks like an old school sort of walking stick. And I'll show you what I mean, something like that. And you've got um, a bit of it jutting out medially towards the glenoid. Um, and that is the sort of shape and contour that it should have. If it looks rounder, um, a bit more symmetrical, then you're thinking that its position is slightly abnormal. Um, some of you may have heard of the light bulb sign or the chicken drumstick sign of posterior dislocations when you have this abnormal contour. Um, uh, and so that's the first thing to look out for. The second thing is the position. So here we can see really nicely that it's just right up against the glenoid. Um, whereas in our case uh, where we had the question, it wasn't in that position and we'll come back to that. Um, so we want to see it in this sort of position. Uh, a useful question to ask yourself is, is the humeral head below the coracoid process? So remember, this is the coracoid process. If the humeral head is below the coracoid process, you can uh, say confidently that there is, you know, some sort of dislocation, it's abnormal, and it's usually a, an anterior dislocation. Okay, so those are the first two checks that you can do on an AP radiograph. The second thing that you want to look for is the acromioclavicular joint. So um, obviously the shoulder joint isn't just the glenohumeral, although that's what uh, people commonly refer to, but you've also got this thing up here, the acromioclavicular joint. Uh, and what you want to make sure is that there's satisfactory alignment between the ends of the clavicle and the acromion on both sides. And if it's disrupted, or if this, this thing is all the way up here, uh, which you can often tell clinically, then you'd be suspicious for an acromioclavicular dislocation. Another way of checking that is looking at what's called the coracoclavicular distance. So if you go from the top of the coracoid process, so the bottom of the clavicle, and measure that distance, it should be less than 14 millimeters. If it's more than that, and typically you'll see this is raised all the way up as well. And um, if it's more than that, then you can say that there's a chromiocurricular joint disruption. Uh, and usually there's a ligament here, uh, which holds those two bits of bone together. And so you're saying that there's injury of that ligament. And then finally, like you would do with any sort of radiograph, you need to look at all of the bones Draw, try and see if you can draw a line along the outside of all of them, looking for any cortical breaks, any sort of jagged edges, any lucent lines or anything like that. Um, and so I, what I do is I just pick a bone and then follow it all the way around to make sure that I can't see anything, pick another bone and keep going. And so yeah, you would do that with the humerus, you do that with the clavicle, the scapula, the ribs uh, as well, and just to make sure. Okay, moving on. So there's one bit of the um, radiograph that I haven't mentioned, um, and it's a really important bit. And I, I don't know if we can, uh, I can't see the chat function, but if I, I would be super impressed if someone could tell me what the abnormality is on this. Uh, this is that same x-ray that I've been showing you um, uh, as if it's normal, but it's not normal. Um, and I'll zoom into, the area. I can't see the chat function, so I don't know if anyone said anything. But um, if people can post on the Q&A section, uh, I'll read out any answers that are posted there. Okay, fine. I'll give you 10 seconds. Again, this is really hard. I, I don't know if I would have seen this, um, but uh, it's uh, interesting. We have one answer so far. Any other takers? Uh, cervical rib is what someone said. That's a good thought, but uh, unfortunately, no. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put you out of your misery. So 
there is a very i don't know how this is projecting onto your screens at home as well uh, but there is a very faint uh line going across there and if you look beyond that line there are no lung markings we can see all these nice little fluffy uh pulmonary vessels essentially we don't see any of that beyond that line and that's uh, a pneumothorax there um, and that's something that i've seen quite a few times actually people come in with non-specific vague pains around the, the shoulder they have a shoulder x-ray and there's actually a pneumothorax there um, and all of that is just say, don't forget the lungs, because it is included in the shoulder x-ray, so do have a look at it. Okay. Moving on. So now we've got our second view. Um, the, in the, there's lots of different second views that you can take of the shoulder. Um, the common one in the trauma setting is an either an apical oblique view or an axial view and here you get to see um, in really nice detail um, what the relationship between the humeral head and the glenoid is and so you can see that really clearly here it's really nicely uh, jutting up against that glenoid um, and if it wasn't then um, you'd know that there was a dislocation whether it's anterior or posterior um so that that's the i think that's the key thing to take away from the second view on this of course again you want to look at all the bones um and the, a fracture might be better seen on uh, on this alternative view on this uh on this view actually there is a fracture so if you look down here there's a little tiny fragment of bone just at the inferior aspect of the inferior glenoid um, and that's what's known as a bony bankart fracture um, and it's a complication of an anterior dislocation. Okay, so if we come back to our case, I had just given you this radiograph in the question. And so we can ask ourselves, uh, we can go through our checklist and ask ourselves those questions. So we can see the shape of the humeral head actually looks as you'd expect, you know, it's bigger medially um, and it's got that sort of walking stick, uh, walking stick appearance as opposed to a drumstick or a light bulb. Uh, then our next question is the position. So here we can say, we'll ask our question, is it below the coracoid process? This is the coracoid process and the humeral head is below it and it is, and therefore we can say there's an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Um, and then we can confirm that on our axial oblique view where the contour of the humeral head is no longer up against that glenoid um, surface. Um, and then we go through the rest of our checklist to make sure that there isn't another injury. So there's the acromioclavicular joint looks fine and we can't see any fractures and uh, there's not much lung, but the lungs look okay. All right, so that's a shoulder radiograph, anterior dislocation, really common. Um, I saw it when I was an F2 in A&E &E, um, and so it's, useful to be able to know how to um, assess that on a radiograph. Okay, um, we'll move on to our next question and do feel free to put any questions in the q and I'm more than happy to take any. Okay, so if we could get the poll function up again and we'll give you another 30, 45 seconds. We've got a 50, 50 year old woman with early morning stiffness and raised inflammatory markers she has radiographs taken of her hands and I've just given you the right hand. Which feature is not present on this radiograph? 30 seconds starting there. Okay, so that's 30 seconds. Thank you very much, everyone who voted. Cool. And let's see. D, awesome. So majority got the right answer, osteophyte formation. So I thought this was, this is a tricky um, case to tell from the radiograph. There's a lot going on. Um, but uh, I tried to um, 
make it so that you could get it from the clinical picture anyway. So a 50 year old woman with early morning stiffness and raised inflammatory markers, you're thinking that they've got some sort of inflammatory arthritis. Um, and in a 50 year old woman, uh, a, a most likely one is going to be rheumatoid. And so uh, this question is really just assessing your knowledge of um, what, what are the features of really graphic features of rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis and all of the ones that are mentioned are rheumatoid except for D uh, osteophyte formation which is seen in osteoarthritis so well done to those of you who got that um, so we'll go through some of those features and try and I'll try and explain how what what bits of the radiograph look like because it's it's not an easy thing okay so the the one of the biggest um uh, or one of the earliest features of rheumatoid arthritis is soft tissue swelling. So rheumatoid being, I don't know if you guys will know this better than I do, but uh, an auto autoimmune synovitis. Um, and so, you know, you're going to get some inflammatory fluid, particularly in the very early stages. And so uh, you might actually in very early rheumatoid see widening of the joint space um, and surrounding soft tissue, which hopefully you can tell clinically um, as opposed to on the radio bar. But soft tissue swelling is, is a key feature of rheumatoid, whereas you wouldn't necessarily see that in osteoarthritis. Um, I don't think that's particularly evident on this radiograph, and particularly if you've got, um, you know, you're going to have symmetrical polyarthritis in rheumatoid, even if you're comparing to another hand, um, it, they might both look swollen or just look symmetrical, so it's difficult to tell. And the next thing is periarticular osteopenia. The osteopenia just means a reduction in bone density. Um, and so if you uh, take this first metacarpal and you're looking in the middle, it's, it's relatively bright. It's not quite as bright as the cortex on the outside, but it's relatively bright. But you come up here um, looking um, at the head of the first metacarpal just adjacent to the joint and it's really quite dark and it's the same on the other side in the proximal phalanx um, so that the fact that it's so dark is indicative of there being periarticular osteopenia um, and that is a feature of rheumatoids as well as some other inflammatory arthrit um, arthritis um, but in the clinical picture that's it. Uh, the, some other features are joint erosion so these are just like imagine a little bug is bitten out a chunk of bone um, and so if we focus again on this um, first metacarpal head um, you can see just like a little chunk of bone just like it's been bitten out there and here as well probably here as well um, so that those are joint erosions which you wouldn't see in osteoarthritis eventually you end up with loss of joint space um, and that's a, a shared feature with osteoarthritis and then specific to the hands, I remember finals and uh, paces exams, you know, classic, you often get a hand examination. Um, so a lot of these things you will know, you just need to kind of relate them to uh, an x-ray. Um, so predilection for the metacarpal phalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints. So you can see these, are the MCP joints seem were the most affected. Um, and then the proximal interphalangeal joints, but then there's sparing of the distal uh, interphalangeal joints, which is more affected uh, in osteoarthritis. Uh, and then you've got other features like ulnar deviation and subluxation at the MCP joints, which uh, isn't demonstrated on this uh, radiograph. And then you've got your really bad deformities like swan neck and boutonnier, which hopefully we don't really see much of nowadays. Okay. So now features of osteoarthritis. So uh, this is a very uh, severely affected hand. Um, there are four features uh, which you should know. So loss of joint space, like I said, is common with uh, inflammatory arthritis um, and it's usually asymmetric. So if we look at, if we take for example, this uh, proximal, um, uh, the, the MCP joints here, you can see there's probably a bit more widened space um, on this aspect and it's a bit less on this side, so it's usually asymmetric. Uh, and then you've usually got subchondral sclerosis. Um, so these bones are generally osteopenic, so 
very very osteopenic but once you get to the articular surface you can see a very bright white line uh, on that distal interphalangeal joint there so those very white lines are characteristic of osteoarthritis um, subchondral cysts or geodes um, i don't have any examples of that on this radiograph but you would sit just uh, under the articular surface you would see a cystic structure just a very lucent round well-defined structure and then finally osteophyte formation so i'm just going to zoom into this so uh, there's a lot of osteophyte formation on this um, picture so you see these overhanging bits of bone extra bit of bone there lots of extra bone there around the joint those are all features of uh, osteoarthritis and uh, my understanding in terms of the pathophysiology is that it's uh, the bones attempt to heal so it grows more new bone but ends up being problematic anyway so those are features of osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis um, i would say just from a clinical point of view you know osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis aren't you know a radiological diagnosis um, it's all just part of a bigger picture taking into account symptoms examination blood tests um, and those sorts of things and then it may be used maybe to monitor severity uh, treatment and um, those sorts of things um, so we often don't really make a diagnosis and hope particularly with rheumatoid um, you know we're hoping to only see very subtle changes um, because hopefully we're catching it earlier and treating it earlier. Okay, moving on, question three. So if we get the poll up again, uh, we've got a 30 year old man who's had trauma to his knee, um, x-ray taken. So which option best describes the starred region? I'm basically asking this, this dark uh, semicircular or crescent shaped bit, what, what is that bit? Um, so give you 30 seconds to answer that. Three seconds in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, ah, so we've got a bit of a mix here. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a trick question. I feel bad now. The correct answer is A, um, bone marrow fat. Uh, so well done to the two of you who got that. Um, lipohem arthrosis is, I I'll give you that. <laughs> um, but let let's go through why, that, why this is uh, bone marrow fat and not um, lipohem arthrosis. So um, this is how the x-ray is actually taken. Um, it's taken with the person's uh, knee in a horizontal position. Um, and what we're left with is this fat fluid level, which a lot of you have identified as lipohem arthrosis. Um, so what, what, what does lipohem arthrosis mean? Um, so arthrosis just means pathology related to, well, related to the joint. Um, lipo is obviously fat and heme is going to be blood. So what it's really saying is that there's blood and uh, fat within the uh, joint. Um, and what happens is the reason why you get blood and fat in the joint is that you've got an intra-articular fracture. So we can see lots of fracture lines here that are disrupting the tibial plateau. And uh, fat from the bone marrow leak and blood leak out into the joint and they layer in this way. Fat goes up to the top and then blood at the bottom. So lipohem arthrosis is a description of the entire appearance, but uh, what is actually in this darker bit at the top is bone marrow fat. Um, so yeah, maybe my question wasn't phrased particularly well, um, but that's, that's what's going on there. And so, so we've got that nice fat fluid level. So how do we look at a knee x-ray? So we're going to start with the lateral film. Um, and there's a couple of questions that you should ask yourself. 
so we'll, we'll quickly go through anatomy. So um, this is superior. We've got the femur here. We've got the femoral condyles coming along there. We've got our patella, and then we've got our tibia. And um, probably just see a bit of an outline of the fibula there as well. And some soft tissue, we've got um, the quadriceps tendon joining the patella, and then you've got your um, patella tendon joining the tibial tuberosity, which is just cut out there. And so we've got our suprapatella compartment and then our infrapatella compartment. Uh, one of the options was Hoffer's fat pad. Hoffer's fat pad is um, the fat in this infrapatella compartment. It's just a normal anatomical structure. Okay, so the questions that we ask ourselves is, first of all, is there a joint effusion? So we're looking in the suprapatella compartment and um, we can see that it's a nice dark colour, um, which is similar to fat. Um, if there is any sort of increased density in here, um, then we can suggest that there's a, a joint effusion and that can be confirmed on ultrasound. Then we want to ask ourselves, is there a fat fluid level like we saw in the, in the case? Um, and so you all know what that looks like now. And that, if you see a fat fluid level, even if you can't see a fracture on whatever view, um, you have to assume that there is one because where else would that fat and fluid have come from? Um, so you, you would still treat it as a fracture, get an orthopedic referral, and they might want to do more imaging to identify where the fracture is and what treatment it needs. Okay, then we ask ourselves, are the condylar surfaces smooth? So we come along here, we've got one condyle here, and we go all the way around, and then we can see there's a little bit of a bone flake heard of a high ring patella or patella alta, um, which just can be associated with joint laxity or increased risk in uh, patella dislocation. And there's some rules about uh, how you find patella alta, different issues that you can work out. But generally, you just want to see if it's really high or if it's really low. Um, it should generally be at, at the level of the femoral condyles. And then you just want to look around for any small flakes of bone like we saw there or here. Um, that could be representative fraction. You can confirm that on the AP view. Uh, one sort of uh, normal variant is a fabella, which is a sesamoid bone which sits in the tendon of a muscle. I cannot remember off the top of my head. Okay, so that's a lateral view. Uh, now we've got the AP view. So um, Again, so this is our femur and we've got our femoral condyles demonstrated nicely. We've got our tibia, we've got the tibial plateaus and then the tibial spines. And we've got our fibula head and neck here. And then projected through or over the, the uh, distal end of the femur is the patella. So you see this round region of increased density is the patella. So um, your checklist here is going to be to look at the tibial spines. Um, the fractures of these can be really subtle and difficult to tell, um, but you, so you want to take a close look at those and look for any lucent lines through them. You want to look at the intercondylar eminence, so the bit between the condyles. Um, and sorry, that's the intercondylar fossa. You want to look at the bit between the fossa and the intercondylar eminence here. Then you want to look at the tibial plateaus. These should be really, really smooth. You shouldn't see any uh, any lucent lines or any bumps through them. So you can see that here uh, as well, very, very smooth. Um, look at the patella. Sometimes you can see fracture lines through, um, through the femur, just like a lucent line going through. Um, and then finally, like, like we said before, any small fragments of bone that might make you think there's a small uh, displaced fracture. Okay, so that was knee done. Okay, moving on. So if we get the poll up again, we've got a 40 year old woman 
who presents with elbow pain after falling onto an outstretched hand. What does the radiograph show? So we'll give you 30 seconds for that. Thirty seconds. Um, yep. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, so yeah, this was a tricky one. Um, and most of you thought it was normal, um, and a couple of you um, thought that there might be a posterior fat pad, which is the correct answer and I'll show you that. So the presence of a posterior fat pad is always abnormal on, on an elbow x-ray um, and it indicates that there is uh, fluid or blood within the uh, joint space um, and if it's blood that would suggest that there's been a fracture. Uh, so I've drawn some arrows. So I hope you can appreciate now that I've pointed it out is it is difficult, but there is a, a dark uh, region just posterior to the distal humerus. Um, and we, we shouldn't really see that at all. Um, it should be the same sort of density all the way up against the humerus. So even if you see a very thin one, um, that suggests that um, there's an elbow joint diffusion. And another thing to note as well is that there is a whole dark region here and that suggests that the anterior fat pad is elevated. Now, you can see the uh, anterior fat pad normally, but if it is elevated to such a degree as it is in this case, um, then uh, that also suggests that there's fluid. Um, this would be difficult to see, but there is through the radial head of a, a small fracture there, which is what has caused this big joint effusion. Um, and I'll just show you the alternative view. So if we have a look here, I hope that's clearer for you now, you can see that there's a radial head fracture and that fits with the picture. Sometimes you'll just see a posterior fat pad and an elevated anterior fat pad and you can't see any fracture, but those patients should still very much like a lipohemarthrosis um, be managed as, uh, as though they do have a fracture. Okay, so how do we read an elbow x-ray? I think elbows are actually fair once, once you've seen a few and you ask yourself these questions, they can become quite, uh, quite straightforward. So on the lateral view in particular, you want to look for those fat pads. So if we look at this x-ray, you can see there's a nice relatively um, consistent homogeneous density behind uh, that distal humerus. Um, and here we're just getting a bit more like subcutane, uh, a bit of fat, but that's well past that soft tissue there, which is probably muscle tendon. So there's no, there's no posterior fat pad, which is what you want to see. Anteriorly, we can see a thin uh, area of lucency or that's just a bit darker, which is an anterior fat pad. And unlike our case before, you know, which was all the way out here, that's, you know, quite shallow and within normal. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing. Then you want to look at the radial head. The radial head should be smooth, smooth, smooth. Um, it can be difficult in the beginning when you're trying to look at bone that's projected over other bone, um, but that's um, that just takes some practice. Um, so look at the radial head and look at the rest of the radius to make sure that there's no fracture there. And then the last question is, is the radio capitella line normal? And we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so yeah, on the AP view, again, you want to ask yourself, is the radial head smooth? So we can see quite a nice smooth contour, no lucid lines that are abnormal coming through there. Okay, radio capitella line. So this is a line that goes um, through the radial shaft and the radial head and should go through the capitellum. So what's the capitellum? Capitellum is the bit of the distal humerus that articulates with the radius. 
Um, and its opposite is this bit, which articulates with the ulna, and it's known as the trochlea. So capitellum radius, trochlea ulna. So this line should go through the middle of the radius and through the capitellum on both the AP and lateral views. If it doesn't, um, then we are worried about this. So we can see that this isn't going through, this is going through radial head and then all the way up to the humeral shaft um, when it should be going through here. And that tells you that there's a radial head dislocation. Um, so we have another question here. Uh, if we could get the pole up again. So we've got that radial head dislocation and we've also got an ulnar shaft fracture. What's the eponymous name given to this? Three seconds, three, two, one. Okay, uh, so yes, we, so yeah, it's been fairly evenly split between Galeazzi and Montegia, and Montegia just winning out, which is the correct answer. So yeah, Montegio fracture is um, oh, it's a fracture dislocation pattern of an ulnar shaft fracture and a radial head dislocation. Galeazzi, you've got a distal radial shaft fracture and a distal radial ulnar dislocation. Um, Collies is uh, a wrist fracture, as you know. Um, a massa nerve is a fracture that there's a fracture dislocation pattern that happens in the ankle and fibula, and a Sagon fracture is a upon saying for a fracture and the uh, lateral tibial plateau. Okay, before we move on, I think there are, there are a couple of Q and A's, which I'm happy to answer. Um, so someone's asked, where is the anterior fat pad located and how to see it? So we can go back to this case. So the anterior, so in terms of when you're looking at radiographs, um, the people describe four, generally different densities. Um, there is soft tissue, there's fat, um, there's bone, and then there's air. So outside here is air, it's very, very dark. This is obviously bone, this is soft tissue. And then fat is this sort of darker bit here. It's just darker than, it's between, um, it, it's darker than uh, soft tissue but not as dark as air essentially and so there is this very uh, I appreciate it's probably difficult to see through screens but if you're looking at a, at a computer at work or if you manage to find a PAX workstation to look at it you I'm sure you will be able to see it there's nothing special about uh, radiologist eyes um, but yeah there is a, a slightly darker bit there and then on the case where it was pathological if we go back to that so I've just drawn up this arrow there is an area of lucency that is darker than this bit of soft tissue here. And it's a similar density to here. So remember, you're not seeing the blood here, you're seeing that fat pad, which has been elevated because blood is where it, where the fat pad used to sit. Okay, um, I hope that's answered that question. And then we've got another, can you show the blood outlines in the bone marrow case? Okay, so I think that means the knee case. Yeah, they were referring to the yeah. hypothyrophosis. Sure. So, um, so th this is that fat fluid level, um, and the the bit on top, that crescent shaped dark bit, is fat, uh, and it's darker, like how we saw in what I was just saying in the elbow. And then this uh, brighter bit is going to be the blood um, below it. Um, so I think I hope that answers that question. And finally, so if you suspect a shoulder dislocation from history, how would you examine the shoulder? 
God, uh, <laughs> outside of my expertise, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's well, orthopedic examinations, look, feel, move, um, those sorts of things. But I guess you do need to be careful and they're going to be in a lot of pain. Um, so, yeah, and you, I guess you also want to look for neurovascular compromise. Um, but I have to admit, it's, it's not my expertise. I haven't examined someone's shoulder in quite a few years now. Um, so maybe, maybe worth asking an, an A&E doc or an orthopedic doc for that question. Um, okay. So coming up to our last case of the day. Um, so if we get the poll up again, thank you, Finn. <laughs> Finn uh, it's been a lot of uh, poll running. But so we've got an 81 year old lady who's uh, presenting following a fall and is having some difficulty weight bearing. What, which best describes the fracture present? So I'll give you 30 seconds for that. Okay, great. Yeah, so a lot of you have got that inferior pubic ramus fracture. Um, I think we all assume elderly lady um, with a four, we think of an off, um, but actually um, pubic ramus fractures are the most common uh, injuries um, in uh, uh, pelvic injuries uh, following a fall. Um, so how do we look at pelvic radiographs? So this is a normal, a normal pelvis. Um, just to go through a bit of anatomy. Um, so we've got both sides, which is nice, so we can compare. Uh, but we've got our femoral head here on both sides. We've got our greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, femoral neck, and then femoral shaft is just going to be below that. Um, then we've got our um, pubic, and so we've got the ilium, we've got our acetabulum, which is where the femur um, articulates, we've got our superior and inferior pubic rami, and then our pubic bones, and in the middle we've got our pubic symphysis. These foramina that are formed by the superior and inferior pubic rami are called the obturator foramen. Um, what else can I show you? So, and then, yep, yeah, of course, we've got our sacral iliac joints bilaterally, which are really important. You've got the sacrum coming down here, which can be sometimes quite difficult to visualize. And then you've got the lower lumbar spine all the way along here. Um, some other landmarks. So, we've got anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine on either side as well. Um, Cool, and I think we'll leave anatomy there. So pel pelvic um, x-rays can be quite challenging because there's a lot going on. You've got bowel superimposed over bone and bladders in there as well sometimes. And then people might have catheters in and all sorts going on. Um, so it can be difficult to kind of try and figure out what's going on. Um, but uh, we stick to our rules and develop a system. Um, I think a lot of you already know some of the rules for looking at uh, NOFs and you know trying to find Shenton's line. Um, so obviously you're going to look at the, the the femur and draw its outline, look for any fractures, any lucent lines, or any sclerotic lines which might happen in an impacted fracture. Um, but some of the things that you want to look for as well are. Um, the looking at pelvic rings. So there's the main pelvic ring, which is formed by this sort of outline that I'm coming around. And you wanna really closely follow that uh, to look for any breaks 
Um, and that will help you see, for example, any superior pubic rami fractures, any acetabular fractures, um, or any other fractures along the sacrum or the iliac wings. Um, I have to say, you know, you're only really likely to see the that, you know, particularly acetabular and um, sacral and iliac wing fractures in quite high energy trauma. And those patients often go on to have CTs anyway at presentation. So we often pick those up. Um, so once you've had a look at your main pelvic ring, then you look at these two smaller rings, which I mentioned called the obturator foramen, looking for any lucent lines for any further fractures. Um, then you want to look at the pubic symphysis. So the superior aspect of it should align up on both sides, as should the inferior aspects. And if they don't line up, then you might have uh, a diastasis of the pubic symphysis, uh, which um, again is usually seen in only very high energy trauma. Um, and then you want to look at the sacral iliac joints. They should be symmetrical um, in that. So you can see this lucent line coming across. Those should be similar size on both sides. Um, and there shouldn't be any sort of sclerosis or anything like that, but that's more so in the context of pain, back, chronic lower back pain as opposed to trauma. Um, okay, so I think those are the main things to, to look up for in a, a pelvic x-ray. And so that's our last case. And I think that's me pretty much done. Just to reiterate, uh, this book is great and will go into a lot more detail than I have. And there's, a lot more, there's loads of diagrams and examples of different fracture patterns. So we'd strongly recommend if you're interested um, and do go on that course as well. Um, from what I remember, it was like, I think it, it wasn't too expensive. Um, all right. So thank you very much for listening and happy to take any more questions if anyone has any. And thank you again, Finn, for running all the polls.